what you need to understand is uh, one here and one there. Uh, what you need to understand is what are the facts that had led to spark, what spark is doing, what's the difference between spark and a traditional MapReduce, what's in the future, what is there in the spark stack, all these things we will see one by one. So uh, the discussion starts with uh, our very first day one where when I explained to you the fundamentals of MapReduce, we have written a horse race program where multiple horses are running as a single threaded, oh sorry, multi threaded um, application on the laptop. And uh, slowly from there, we took the concept of MapReduce. Again, the same example we are taking now, right? And uh, we wanted to write a small function. And you are all familiar with that particular syntax, that is Scala syntax, where I'm creating an immutable variable, result, val means immutable, you can't change it, the very fundamental property of functional programming. Race dot map, race can be a collection, that collection will be containing so many uh, host names, etc. Race dot map, you are applying a transformation function on the top of a collection race dot map map takes a function as a parameter in functional programming a function can be a parameter and you can write anonymous functions the ability of a function to take a function as a parameter is called higher order functions Scala supports higher order functions and inside the function I didn't write any name to my particular function. Instead, I could have written map inside my function equal to and then start the left curly brace and finish the right curly brace and then finish the bracket. I could have written that entire code, but as an advanced Scala programming strategy, you will be writing anonymous functions and that anonymous function is taking each horse from the race collection and then it is going to run. And I am calling another function jockey to ride. The jockey is going to ride that particular horse. That is going to run on one desktop. It is going to be executed using the CPU and the available power that you have on one single machine. That's what is happening here, right? It is not a, a, a multi threaded program like what we have seen earlier. It is just a single execution and race is a collection that you have created. So before you are writing this particular line, you might have created a collection race by telling that, okay, race equal to new list. And then you give all the uh, host names and then you could have called that particular method. It happens on one system, right? Now, when the things are little bit advanced, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to use that functional language Scala and Scala has got parallel features inbuilt and then we are going to tell that, okay, execute the same function but instead of relying on one thread like in the earlier slide, we are going to have multiple threads. So many threads are processing the shared memory. What is the shared memory? Your RAM is shared between different threads. This is how it works. This is your CPU and this is your RAM. When you write a single threaded program, CPU fetches the data from RAM and executes the instructions. When you write a multi-threaded program, there will be many slices which is going to be executed by the CPU. It will fetch the data. This will fetch two horses. This will fetch two horses. This will fetch two horses and then it will get executed in parallel. This CPU will have internally cores and each core 
may be running either one thread or two threads depending upon the processor and then it is going to execute the things in parallel. Remember that parallelism is on one computer, on one CPU and this particular thing is shared memory. The RAM is shared between the multiple threads unlike in a single threader or a single application your RAM is only be shared by one particular CPU. This is not shared memory. This is a dedicated memory to the CPU. This is shared memory. So that shared memory execution is happening on one computer again, right? Scala has got inbuilt factors like ACCA, inbuilt uh, concurrency mechanisms to allow you to write beautiful concurrent applications and still it is happening on one system. If you go further, right, you can see that now we are going to make the execution little bit complex. Instead of one computer, this is one computer now, I am going to say that there is another computer coming in and that computer also has got a CPU and that has got its own RAM and your horses are now shared between different computers different nodes rather than limiting to a one particular system and one particular CPU. And when that happens, one system is running multi-threaded program, another is running multi-threaded program, another is running multi-threaded, another is running multi-threaded and you need to combine all the four. And so many things will come into picture now. Earlier, when you were having only one system and uh, one particular CPU, you never cared about latency, you never cared about coordination, you never cared about polymorphism in the different systems. For example, one system can be in Microsoft Windows, another may be in Unix, the third one may be in Linux. You never bothered about all those things. But the moment you are introducing another system, so many things are coming into picture. One, the most important thing is latency. We are going to see it in detail. Then the ability to coordinate and the ability to work across different kinds of CPUs, different kinds of operating systems, everything will come into picture. And the most important thing is the latency. Okay, Why latency is important, we are going to see it in detail right so what we are going to do is that we are going to change the architecture we are going to split the data over several nodes earlier you created a list what was the code that you have written here your list is going to contain all the host names and that list is created on your scala prompt which means that it is lying only on one system here also it is one system only, but you will use the concurrent concurrency concepts in uh, Scala in order to parallelize it. But when it is coming to other systems, first what you are going to do, you are going to distribute your data. And then the nodes are independently operate on the data shards in parallel. That's a very good term if anybody is telling you about data sharding. Shard means a block of the data, part of the data. So if you have 1000 horses, each number of horses, let's say 200 horses, I'm going to divide it in between five, five different systems. Each 200 horses can be called as a shard, okay? If you go to the technologies like Oracle, Teradata, etc., they will tell that sharding is automatic. What does that mean? When the data is becoming more, it will do an auto sharding of that particular data. For example, today, let's say one gigabyte of data is being handled by Teradata and then at a suddenly 10 gigabytes is coming. You have to reshard your data, rebalance your data, right? In Hadoop, admin people will run a command called a, a disk rebalancer, which will allow you to rebalance HDFS. That's an admin part. You might have thought that in Hadoop, your HDFS is containing 10 gigabytes of data today and uh, it is distributed into blocks of 256 or 128 MB blocks and then assume that suddenly 20 GB is coming. 
how that 20 GB is going to be allocated. Are they going to be allocated across um, independent another set of computers or that 20 GB is going to come and going to be resharded across the existing plus new. Actually, it has to be resharded right across the current systems and the new systems. You will run a rebalancer. That's where Hadoop admin will come and the HDFS command will be Google to attend. Some of you might have already used the safe mode minus leave command which is an Hadoop admin command. So you will be writing Hadoop FS DFS admin and then safe mode minus leave which means that you are telling that don't use safe mode for your name node. In the similar way there are rebalancer commands. So there are automatic data, sh data shards in parallel and you will have to combine the results whenever everything is complete. Never bothered about all those things here. Why? Because threading, automatic default facilities and the constructs in the language is allowing you to do all these things. But the moment it is distributed between the different nodes, it will become the responsibility of the client programmer or the program in order to combine all the results and give you the correct value. Right? I would suggest strongly to join the Coursera course on the big data analytics with Scala and Spark. It is free. You can join that and you will get most of this particular material from there. I have extracted those from that. Uh, it's a very, very nice course, uh, big data analytics with Spark and Scala. So let us look at the latency numbers. Very, very important slide, right? You can see some words like L1, L2, main memory, etc. What is the difference between L1, L2, cache, memory and all? What are those things mean? That is very important in order to understand what is internally happening inside Spark and what Spark is bringing. A particular system, okay, the Vaughn Newman model has got a CPU and it has got a RAM and it has got the instructions which are getting executed, right? Basically, CPU and RAM are the ones which are playing the important uh, roles other than the input and output devices. Input normally is your keyboard, output is your screen. So you have got CPU and RAM and always any data or any calculation CPU has to do, it has to go to the RAM, it has to fetch the data. If there is a hard disk available from the hard disk, it has to bring to the RAM. You cannot do performance or computation on the hard disk directly. You have to bring the data onto the RAM and then you will do the computations, okay? So, assume that RAM is a big safe or an Almara in this particular room, okay? And everything is kept. So, whenever I want to do some computation, I am just going to that particular Almara, open this and then I am going to do that particular computation. Now, Intel and other processing companies like AMD came up with a new approach. In that new approach, they told that, yes, that Almara is there, but I'm going to have two small racks on my table also. Whichever I recently want, what I'm going to do is that always I do some computation. So I will take some of the things from that Almara and keep it inside my rack here and my rack here. There are two racks. One rack is called L1 cache and another rack is called L2 cache. What does that mean? The CPU, whenever it is executing the systems and the instructions at that time, it doesn't need to go to that RAM which is there. It can just open this and you can take it and you can do the performations, uh, transformations and the calculations. Which means that L1 and L2 caches are bringing the computation much faster than fetching the things from the RAM. So it is a part of RAM but that L1 and L2 caches are being used. Okay. Any programmer has ever thought that Whenever you write a Java program, how can you make use of L1 and L2 cache instead of RAM? That is where the tuning and beauty of the programming is coming in, right? You should always make use of the L1 and L2 cache rather than using the RAM in order to make your computation much faster. The most latest processors from Intel like Xeon, etc. are coming up with very bigger sizes of L1 and L2 cache. Just now I told you about the uh, small rack under my table, right? That has got a limited size. L1 and L2 cache are not as big as RAM. It is very limited in size. So they are now thinking of improving that L1 and L2 cache so that that Almara itself can be represented as in L1 so that the computation is going to be much, much faster. Use Java 8. In Java 8, they have got mechanisms in built in order to use or leverage L1 and L2 rather than using the RAM. That's why there is a significant performance boost between 
the earlier versions of Java and Java 8 because there is a processor based uh, optimization as well as L1 and L2 based optimization they are bringing in. So that's about L1 and L2 and if you can clearly see that you know L1 cache reference is 0.5 nanoseconds whereas L2 cache reference is 7 nanoseconds okay you can see it's very very close and you can see it is 100 nanoseconds that Almara so I have to walk to the Almara I have to take it that's why it is taking a little bit more than that of L1 and L2 that's what you are seeing here and please look at disk it is 10 milliseconds if you are looking at that particular value and divide the disk seek by this particular main memory reference you will see that it is 10 to the power of some 8 times faster which means that if you are creating a computing model which is relying on RAM L1 and L2 rather than the disk seek that will be much faster right and those particular experiments has been done have been done in a very high scale and those numbers have come up uh, uh, like this and there is a beautiful source the link is here you can click on that and you can see the latest results always this is when I created this particular slides and as you can see RAM access is 10 to the power of 6 times faster 5 times faster than uh, than the than the disk seek so if suppose you are looking at some of the things this is a this is the Coursera slide and if you are looking at how much time it will take our network next is network right so if you are looking at the network speed you will see here and disk speed you will see here and memory speed you will see here and if you are making a comparison you can see that memory is the fastest disk is slow and network is the slowest and what did we just now told about the horse race example we are going to parallelize it across the nodes and when I am parallelizing it across the nodes what is the biggest problem that you are going to uh, encounter it is the network so if or unless the computing model or computation model is not capable of managing that latency very effectively your computation framework is going to fail and that's the fundamental concept behind MapReduce which we have seen and that's the whole very intuitive explanation of MapReduce is how you will avoid that network latency and make computation faster right and many things you have to handle partial failures should not be there heterogeneity should be managed there should be a coordinator to combine all the results when there is failure happening at the time somebody should take over and we have seen in detail resource manager node manager zookeeper secondary name node the replication three times all are working together to give you a seamless experience of shared nothing architecture and bring you the results of MapReduce that's the reason why it became a super hit so if you are visualizing right so memory related cache okay read 1 MB sequentially from memory it is 2.9 days look at the word sequentially okay if you want to read 1 megabyte sequentially from, uh, from disk it is 7.8 months and if you are going through the network it is 4.8 years between US Europe and back these are the calculations that they have created on sample data and you can see the difference that is happening so what's the impact the latency numbers did a great influence on the design of big data processing this is what MIT Berkeley and all the scientists across the world were trying in the beginning of 2000, 2001, 2002, etc. And that's what Google's papers on MapReduce and DFS solved. Right? So, MapReduce was groundbreaking. It provided a simple API, Map and Reduce. You don't write anything, as you remember, Map, Reduce, Driver. We have written as many programs, right? Mapper, the facilities for combiner, the 
facilities for avoiding a reducer, the facilities for partitioning, all these things, fantastically they created MapReduce. This helped Hadoop ecosystem to scale to thousands of nodes. Likelihood of a node or failing is very high. That is why they created duplicate copies of the data. Right. Now look at some of the problems and advantages versus disadvantages. Hadoop achieves fault tolerance by shuffling the data between the nodes. So what is involved inside that? If you want to shuffle the data between the nodes, network is involved. And just now in the previous slides, we have told that the biggest problem in the computations of distributed computing is about network latency, but Hadoop uses network. Writing intermediate file to disk. Every one of you know that whenever you write a MapReduce program, once the map is completed, intermediate files are returned to the local file system. And that local file system is being shuffled to give to the corresponding reducer depending upon the keys. Twinkle should go to one reducer. Little should go to the reducer. Star should go to the third reducer. And then you do the computation. Disk I.O. and network. We have mentioned already that memory is the fastest. But unfortunately, the MapReduce framework much is not relying on the memory. Instead, it is looking at disk input and output and network. Remember, reading and writing to disk is 100 times slower than memory. And network traffic is 10 to the power of this many times slower than the accessing the memory. So, a natural thinking is that let us redesign the whole architecture. To redesign the architecture, first we have to make sure that the things are falling in place to support to some of the latest technologies that are available. First of all, understand how your computer is being formed. Earlier, there was only one CPU and that CPU has been working together, the von Neumann model and then what they have done is they brought L1, L2, L3 caches as you have told. These are the processors. Processors are divided into cores. What is the difference between this and this? This is 486 computer, Pentium computer. This is i7 Intel all those kind of computers. You will see when you are looking at the sticker how many cores are being provided there, right? i7 cores that will be telling. What is the difference between a CPU and a core? A CPU can be divided into many cores and the cores can run multiple threads. A CPU at a time cannot run multiple threads effectively. There is only time slicing that is happening. CPU cannot do actual threading. What CPU does behind is that it will run a task and immediately it will go to the other task. It is not actually the same time the two tasks are happening. By dividing that CPU into different cores, what they have achieved is that each core has got hyper-threading inbuilt so that this can run two threads, this can run two threads, this can run two threads. They created parallel based computing. All programming languages, all systems in the world are done till 2010, 11, 12, 13 is programmed for this. Nobody has written a program for managing this. How can I make sure of same ab initio code or same Informatica code or same Java code or .NET code to make use of this? It's not there, unfortunately. So, ability to change the system to make sure that cores are being handled well is not available currently and the systems are not designed to do that that are that, that are that are that are one of the common problems right and now let us look at what is also happening on the other side right and the other side there was only a single core there was only a single processor that's what the earlier figure was. Everybody started moving into multi-core. And that's what you have. 
every one of you. In the multi-core, you have got many, many processors or cores which can turn the, which can do the things parallelly. So from single core, you move to multi-core. Single core stopped. Intel Tejas, I mentioned to you. Search Wikipedia failed. Reason? Moore's law failed. Why? Moore's law says that every two years the size will be halved and the performance will be doubled. You cannot go beyond the reason heat dissipation. The oxides that are being generated from the CPU is not allowing it to do that particular scaling and you cannot reduce it more than what you have today. So Moore's law is there but it is in the extreme. And now you go, every presentation you look at Amazon presentations, every technology presentations that are coming in, hey, we are GPU compatible. Graphic processing unit, what's the difference between GPU and cores? A GPU can have thousands of cores. And imagine that your programming model is supporting a program or an application to be written to scale to that thousand GPUs or thousand cores in a GPU. How nice it would be. How fast it would be. And this is where the world, world is going on. One of some of the best GPUs available, Tesla is creating the GPUs. So if you look at the computers today, you're, if you are looking at, uh, you know, uh, the, the latest technologies, where is Amazon Cloud de de deployed? You will see Tesla GPUs. This is the idea. Right? I know one of my friend, you know, he told that, you know, they are now selling one GPU based computer. I threw it out and I told that I want a CPU based computer because he doesn't know what is GPU. So if suppose you are buying a laptop, few years you will be asking for how many GPUs? But old questions are all. And GPUs along with the RAM, ultimate parallelism. Fastest possible way, right? So that's where the technology is shifting and all the problems they wanted to address. When you have CPU and GPU, you have to do parallel between CPU and CPU? No, there is no CPU. No, some computer they do still provide CPU along with the CPU. Yeah, but then that it will become too much complex. Okay, they are in the transition stage. Okay, I, I know, I'm not sure that how will be the performance impact if both are there. Right? Maybe because they have not completely moved to GPU, they are in the transition stage. Finally, it is going to be GPUs only, right? So, Spark came in. We will look at the details. First of all, you should understand the word resilient. So, the best way to know I learned is I went to the dictionary. Resilient means it is like a rubber band. You make it big and you leave it, it will regain its size, right? At any time, it can increase the size, it can decrease the size, it can come to the original size, etc. Depending upon what you want in runtime, resiliency can be changed. For example, I want to package these two particular pens with a rubber band. I will take one rubber band with some size and I can uh, tie it multiple times. It will suit to these two pens. I want to pack this laptop in a paper and I completely covered that paper and then I took the same rubber band. I just pulled it. it regain the size for handling my laptop. Resiliency allows you to adjust the size at runtime depending upon the size that you want to manage, whether it is markers or whether it is laptop. Clear? That is resilient. Of course, the horses are going to be distributed across the laptop, so it is distributed. And everything is working on data. You know, Spark is like a lighter, right? Uh, it just creates a spark. But the lighter will be able to light up only if there is oxygen. If there is no oxygen, that spark will come, but nothing will happen, correct? So, Spark is that. That oxygen is the data. And when Spark is provided the data, it becomes the fire. And that fire, if used properly, cooks good food. If it is not proper, properly used, 
the food will not be nice. That's what some of you are facing. Uncompressed data is written. Compressed data is written because the food is not correctly cooked. Right? So, we should have the ability to use Spark, provide the correct data and then cook it. And that cooking is done through assembly line. There is nothing called single stove and somebody is standing and cooking. No, Spark doesn't have it. Spark has got only an assembly line. That's why in the previous discussions, I told about think always about assembly lines. And that assembly line is containing some burners. And I sparked it and there is oxygen. It lighted up and it comes to you. You have got the data. First, you are going to apply a map like adding salt. Properly, you have to add the salt. If it is more, bad. If it is less, bad. If the salt is not put directly inside, bad. So, you will put it directly. And then you will pass on to the next person. You will add the masala. You will add other ingredients. But it is the same line. And it is the cooked food. And as it is moving on, it is getting cooked. And finally, it will reach that person. Final destination where all these transformations will be applied. And then finally, you get that food. And when you are doing this, what you need to visualize, which is not possibly to visualize in the practical world in this example, is when Sam is adding salt, remember that it is not only Sam. Sam has got some friends where that data is distributed. So, think like this. This assembly line is not one line. Assembly line is, assume that, okay, I am putting the fry pan. That fry pan, you visualize that it is divided into 10 pieces, okay. And there are 10 assembly lines coming in. Each has got some part of the fry pan. And then it is coming here. And Sam is adding salt at the same time. Sharva is also adding salt. And other is also adding salt, adding salt in that particular order. And then it moves to the next stage, next stage, next stage like that. Unfortunately, we don't have a parallelism in the real life to do that. So think assembly line and think that that assembly lines are parallel. And then each person is getting their turn to apply what you want to do. And those applications are called transformations. You will transform that input data into what you want to. And then you will apply the other transformation, other transformation. Finally, at the last stage, you will tell that, hey, I am finished with my transformations. Now I want an action to get that real value. It is like serving the final food. Food is ready. Everything is ready. But now you need to serve it. And that serving is the action. If you don't serve. Again a problem with analogy in the real life. Spark will not cook at all. And when that assembly line is moving. Spark will make a graph. Without executing it. So what actually is going to happen is that. This assembly line is coming. Sam wants to add salt. He told that, okay, I want to add salt. Spark will remember. Oh, okay. This guy wants to add salt. But did it add salt? No. Then it goes to Nagendra. And he will add, let's say, the masala. Yeah, Spark remembers. What is the first action? Sam salt. Add the masala. That's the next action. Uh, the next transformation. And those transformations will be kept in the memory. A lineage graph will be created. And that lineage graph is a dream inside Spark. And that lineage graph will be duplicated to other idle nodes. Why? Somehow, at the time that action is called, if Sam is weak to do that, the lineage graph is copied. What did you copy in Hadoop? Data is replicated. Here, what is copied? Graph is replicated. Which is efficient. Graph. That graph which is replicated is going to get executed 
when an action is called, when transformations are applied, nothing is executed. So, if I write a Spark program, if I write 10 transformations, I compile it, you will get an error. Nothing to do. Spark did not execute at all. Clearly, you will see this message. Why? You forgot to tell an action. So, sometimes somebody wants to take data and copy to some JSON or uh, Oracle database and they just wrote that particular code but forgo to write an action. Nothing will happen. Only when an action is being called, Spark knows that, hey, now somebody really wants it. Otherwise, it will not. You, you think like you are going to a restaurant and you ordered some food but that restaurant owner is not going to give you the food until you show your credit card, for example. The moment you show the credit card action, ah, okay, this fellow has got money, I will make it. I told you, in the real life, it's not possible. But is that uh, ideal time is increasing? No, 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 nothing. All are ma ma managed internally. That action is the one which is performing. And there are advantages, many, many advantages. Assume that your action is just making the 10 rows of the initial data. Any framework that you know of, what will happen in Java if you want to read a file and I want to read the first 10 lines? File input stream and you are going to load that entire file. So if the file is 1 terabyte, that 1 terabyte is loaded into the memory. And then you are going to write FS or read in a while loop. And then you are going to take 10 lines. But who is there in the memory? But if your action is only 10, Spark will execute only the 10 lines. Very efficiently configured. Engineering at its best. Because it is coming from teachers. It is not generated or created by a Google. It is created from a university. The years of experience has been added into that. Uh, this is how I will represent. It is a sigma of i equal to 0, i equal to 9, a function of time. This is what Spark is mathematically. You are going to iterate through the data, which is function of time, from 0 to nth and you do some analysis on that. These functions can be one or more. So, my term sometimes I call Spark as sigma data, sigma on data. And uh, to, to, to make it a little bit uh, funny in mathematics, you can write here, uh, this is the sigma and this is, you know, uh, sorry, d of a by t, your calculus and it is i equal to 0 to uh, t equal to 0 to n data. So, sigma pi equal to 0 to n data. So, if you take the d by dt, the changes of that particular one using your calculus and then you add the summation of all such changes together, you get spark. That is what resilient means, right? We are going to see it in detail, do not worry, okay? And uh, we have already seen this slide and that clearly tells you, do not think about Spark that I learned Spark and I am going to use Spark everywhere. No, wrong. What is best Hadoop for? Is Hadoop good for? Good question. Long running service, long running jobs or short running jobs? All the three are different. Long running service is different, long running jobs are different, short running Jobs are different. Anyway, there is no short running service. Long running jobs, that is it. Long running service, what is the difference between long running service and long running job? Long running service is like internet, 24 by 7, no stoppage at all. Long running job is, you are taking 1 terabyte and you are processing it and you are finishing it. It is a long running job. It finishes. Hadoop is meant for only long running jobs. Spark is meant for only short running jobs. That is where the clear distinguishing factor between Spark and Hadoop is coming in. If, if somebody is doing a scoop for taking some data and putting it into some particular place, yes, well and good, okay, go ahead with that. It gives you parallelism, number of mappers, it is giving you, it gives you simple ATL, it gives you the ability to write query in your own way. It gives you the ability to create aliases. It gives you the ability to create your own separators and delimiters. Use it. 
Oh, you want to run it on a data and you want the results very fast so that the next particular processing is going to happen? Depends. At the end of the day, if an organization wants to analyze all the emails and wants to find out how many external mails have come to this particular person, how many confidential mails has been sent out, how many uh, internal mails has been shared, it is a batch process. Why I need Spark? I don't need a real-time capability. But there is a stock price changing and at that time, depending upon that change, I want to create a promotion. No, it cannot be batch. It's a short running job. Go for Spark. That's the difference. What to use when. A brief history. 2009. Four professors. Met at Saharia. At the University of Berkeley started it. Nice interesting story. He had a big project going on. He was handling the Hadoop project. He looked at Hadoop. He looked at what Hadoop can do and got this particular concept and with the help of professor, uh, professors, 65 PhD students <coughs> with the support from big, big companies, they started in 2009. In between, Shark came in, a language. Later, Shark was merged, today known as Spark SQL. And uh, this is until 2015. And after that, you can see up to 2017. Today, what we have is 2.3.0 of Spark. Right? And uh, it has beaten Hadoop in 2014 for a 100 terabyte sort that happened in Daytona. <coughs> you can search Daytona sort. You will get the results. 23 minutes, 100 terabytes. Number of processors and number of cores used, much less than that of Hadoop which means it is programmed to make sure that cores are utilized. In Hadoop, when I write a particular application or a MapReduce, there is no way that you can specify that use this many number of cores. In Spark, you will do that. How the network latency is three? We'll, we'll see, we'll see. The team that created Spark is called AMP Lab. Nice full form for AMP. Algorithms, machines and people. It's in Berkeley. 2011. 65 students as I mentioned to you. And they got funding from 20 plus companies. And they created BDAS. Berkeley Data Analytic Stack. Spark is the core component of BDAS. You can just go and then in the Google just type BDAS and then press enter you will see uh, i think yeah software amp lab us berkeley that initial diagram always watch it every week so that you will know what is there and what is coming in and you will see apache spark as being one of the very core component in which all the ecosystem is residing this is berkeley data analytics stack right and uh, uh, don't worry, there are so much technologies that are going on. And uh, if you ask what is the main difference between the old big data and the new big data, look at this particular uh, diagram. Hadoop came in 2004 to till today. MapReduce was there. But, but they left it after MapReduce. There is an ecosystem the people developed on the top of Hadoop. Mainly with the contributions from Facebook, eBay, etc. What are they? Hive, HBase, Mahout, Impala, Query Engine by Cloudera, TES, Query Engine by Hortonworks. And it is like, you know, you don't buy a phone, okay? You buy all the processors and everything, right? And on the top of that particular thing, you put your own glass, your own cover, and your own headphone, and your own accessories. What is that? When I buy a phone, I want that phone to be complete. Complete in all the sense. But in Hadoop, when they created the ecosystem, you will have to rely 
and every one of this has got its own way of writing programs. We have seen my how we have seen machine learning. When you write machine learning, you need Weka, you need R, you need a decision tree, you need to be creating my how libraries inside for a recommendation engine which you have executed. So, the Pearson correlation or k-means algorithm or clustering algorithm that needs that corresponding packages. You need to understand how the linear regression works. Difficult. Why? Why can't we create a unified engine where everything is there? Everything follows the same syntax. Everything is relying on same resiliency distribution and the data. So, old big data is nothing but thousands of disparate buildings distributed across different places from one building to other building you go, the third building to fourth building you go, depending upon what you want to achieve. Many offices, but all the offices are at disparate places. No, we will create one unified place, one building, every office is there, you just go there and you can get what you, are, what you like. Same API relying on the same base. You don't have to tap every time when you go inside. Only once you tap and you come inside and you go to different rooms because everything is relying on same infrastructure. That's what Spark is all about. And this is the BDAS stack, right? Don't worry, Tachyon changed the name to Alexio. Tachyon is allowing you to create a mirror image of the data. Suppose you are working in your organization, say I am sitting here and I want to get the data from Amazon S3 and I want to write some algorithms on the top of that. Every time when I run the algorithm, it will go and it will bring that particular data. After that, somebody else in my team wants to write an algorithm. They will also connect and bring the data. Very bad. Network is the problem. Latency is the issue. What can I do? I can take that data and I can give a mirror image which will reside on my system so that that mirror image can now be used for analytics. Remember, no writes, only read. Analytics is all about analysis of the data. Source of truth is not changed. In that case, I can create a mirror image. That's what Tachyon is. And today, it is known as Aluxio. A-L-L-U-X-I-O. And there are so many other technologies as well, right? So, if you ask, which are the parallels? Hadoop MapReduce can be changed to Spark. Yarn. You can use mesos, a bidirectional arrow means that either this or this. HDFS, you can use tachyon, just now I mentioned it is optional, a dotted arrow is optional. Hive, no. People started moving into Spark SQL. I told you, Shark changed it to Spark SQL. Mahout, no. Nobody wants to use Mahout algorithms now. MLLib, Spark is giving you machine learning completely algorithms. A storm getting changed. Yeah, fantastic package. There are bolts and spouts in that storm technology, which is allowing you to stream data effectively. Hortonworks platform and all by default comes with storm. What's the problem? You need to learn storm. You need to understand that API. You need to manipulate your own algorithms using storm syntax but if you have spark you don't have to do that so unified computing engine preferably created for short jobs or analytic jobs in a distributed way is spark you can look at the status you can look at the slides that are there and uh, the best way to understand many times uh, I mentioned to you this by www.openhub.net and then type Apache Spark and look at the contribution and the actions that are going on there and click on that and uh, the top uh, this one shows very high activity 43,756 commits uh, by 1,681 contributors, right? It will be very interesting if suppose I go to openhub.net and then type Apache Hadoop 
and uh, look at how it is doing and uh, it is also having very high uh, activity and if suppose you are looking 247 contributors 1681 contributors and if suppose you are coming down and you can see how much it is vulnerabilities and security it is very 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 low and if you look at the code it will tell you how much percentage of the code has been written and you can see 69 percentage of the code the green color is in Scala and you have every reason why they have chosen Scala I have explained it in very very detail that's what Spark is and that's the guy Mata Saharia he is uh, an assistant professor now frequently comes to all Spark conferences and he is the chief technology officer at Databricks Databricks is the company which is giving support for Spark Hortonworks and Cloudera are Hadoop companies. When Spark came in, they adopted Spark into their stack. They started putting Spark, but originally Spark belongs to Databricks. So, when you are running the jobs in Hadoop, it will deal with task trackers, it will deal with data nodes, it will do a map reduce, and it will be executing it. That was Hadoop 1, job tracker was used. Then came Yarn, yet another resource negotiator, where the responsibility of job tracker was divided into resource manager, application manager, application services, containers, etc. Every application will have per application master and then containers will be used. When selecting containers, it will decide what to use, which container to be used, etc. Assume that your data center has got a Hadoop cluster and which is completely yarn and assume that there are 100 computers here and assume that you have got another set of computers for your web applications. This is your data center. Yarn manages only this and yarn is very bad at managing the environment entirely because it can manage the containers and the computers only when the application is running. Only when it is running, application master will be created, containers will be created. As I mentioned earlier, this is very good for long running jobs. But assume that there is a long running service which is your web application. Who is managing these computers then? Can Yarn manage these computers? Answer is no. Yarn can only manage a system where Hadoop is there and MapReduce is there. And the related stuff on the top of Yarn is there. One thing that you can do is you can write and rewrite all this application and Yarnize it. But it's very difficult. There are packages like Slider and there is Twill which you can use to yarnize and then make sure that it is also part of yarn. But they want this yarn cluster and this to be managed very effectively together. That is where containers and Kubernetes is coming in just for your information. So Kubernetes is for managing the entire data center. Kubernetes will manage like how yarn is managing this cluster the entire data center will be managed by Kubernetes. And when Kubernetes is managing, you will put all this in containers. And those containers are called Dockers. So the future is going to be Docker and Kubernetes working together. And Yarn is going to be one such set of containers. So if you go to Azure platform, AKS, or if you go to Amazon platform, you will have the facility to create containers and then when you want to manage the containers, you will use Kubernetes. Okay. Now, so you are very, very familiar with the MapReduce paradigm and uh, you know what is happening in MapReduce. Whenever you are giving the input data, the input data will be first going into the uh, mappers. 
Mappers will be writing the data into intermediate file system. There is a shuffle and sort happening between the intermediate file systems and then it will be given to the reducer and the reducer is going to give the output. And this particular thing is repeated. What Matai Saharia has found out <coughs> when he was working with the projects, Hadoop projects is that MapReduce is excellent, excellent for certain applications. But look at analytical applications. So let me ask you a question. When you are writing a MapReduce program, assume that you wrote a word count. For that word count program, you have, writ uh, you have, you have written your mapper which will be taking the line and reading each and every line. Remember the string tokenizer logic. And then in the reducer, you wrote every word comma one and then you aggregate it. Assume that there is somebody who is writing here, sitting here, wants to reuse, look at the word reuse, that lines read by the mapper to find out something else. To find out whether any positive or negative words are coming in that word. Sentiment analysis. Same. Because you are already reading it. I want to reuse that what you read. So I want a branch in the mapper. After map, this reducer for this team. This reducer for that team. You are stuck. You can't. And what analytics or data scientists demand the ability you have the data i will run a regression algorithm i will run a decision tree algorithm i will run this one like different word count applications the default paradigm in map reduce is map shuffle and sort reduce map shuffle and sort reduce map shuffle and sort reduce there cannot be map map shuffle and sort reduce reduce no map Shuffle and sort, reduce. No. You cannot chain MapReduce. It has got a fixed pattern. You have to follow that pattern. Which Mate understood that a big drawback. Which is alleviating all data analysis and data scientists to use it effectively. I don't say they don't use it. So we need a mechanism by which the data I created and from the data, I will apply a map, I will apply a reduce, I will apply another map, I will apply another reduce. I should have that facility. And if you look at a, a diagrammatic representation of that in map reduce, mapper, shuffle and sort, reducer. Is it possible that there is a, another mapper? And I want to combine this into this reducer. No, it's not possible. You have to write another map reduce program. Whereas you will eliminate this difficulty in Spark. Okay. We will look into this architecture a little bit later. There is a big community. There are a lot of packages that are available in Spark. There is a database coming in called BlinkDB. Very, very interesting database. It is allowing you to give you an answer with an approximation. Imagine your SQL. Uh, assume that, you know, uh, the entire bank's uh, data is there in a very big database. And the CEO, before going to a management board meeting, wants to know how many uh, credit cards has been sold in Singapore yesterday. He cannot wait by running that particular query and get the result accurately. So, he may be asking this question at the higher level, right? Give me a rough estimate. Rough estimate. Can I write a SQL telling that, give me answer up to 50 percentage precision. I don't bother full, correct answer. Give me a result with 20 percentage accuracy. DB is allowing you to give you an answer and how internally blink db does is that it will create answers at every stage and if you are asking a question it will select oh which bar i want to select and i it will immediately give you a lot of innovations are going on there right uh, 
don't worry about that and that's a basic structure you will understand it once you are writing some small programs and all right and then there are some simple scripts that we are going to use in order to do that right so to give you a small idea which we are going to do uh, is let's start spark right and just you see uh, initially that what's going on and how it is working so first i am going to make the ecosystem ready by starting whatever hadoop is uh, needed for 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 spark to run so it is not necessary it doesn't have any dependency on hadoop it is not mandatory that when you are executing spark you need hadoop you can run spark on windows you can run spark anywhere it is unlike hadoop it is not having any relation it is created as a disparate unified engine independent of hadoop but can coexist better with hadoop okay so let's start it and uh, once it is started uh, you can start your application and the very fundamental way is with spark shell So it will show you what is the version. If you have the latest, best version available, you will have 2.3.0. Very easy to install for the Mac users. Only thing that you need to do, download the version that is for your Hadoop. So look at your lib, look at your Hadoop version. It will be 2.7. What you need to do is download Spark 2.7. Build and just put it in the path and add the home slash bin like you did for all your packages all right the prompt is there so what does this mean a scala prompt is coming did i start scala now but if i am not starting scala then why did scala came in because 69 percentage of spark is written in scala and by default spark shell will open a scala interpreter for you to run your code oh you are telling that no i am not familiar i am a great python programmer and uh, i always like python what you will do in that case is you will be writing instead of uh, bin, uh, spark shell you will write pi spark and if you write pi spark then you will not see the scala prompt but you will see a greater than greater than greater than which means that it is now ready to uh, accept any python code hey i am not a python programmer i am not uh, uh, a, a, a scala programmer in that case you will do a spark r and it will now show you the prompt where you can now write r code what a beauty r code python code scala code and java unfortunately doesn't have an interpreter but you can write java also for different languages as your input and it's up to you to play and see the interoperability they have provided an r programmer can easily pick it up a python programmer can easily pick it up and of course the best would be to use scala why because the default language is scala so it is always beneficial to use Scala. So that's a basic way of doing uh, Spark with either Python or with this particular thing. Okay. Now I have got some data files. So please look at this. I am going to open another window and inside this window I have got a data folder and uh, uh, if you look at CD data and then if you look at LS, I have got lot of data here. Okay. Uh, my favorite baby names dot csv okay so there are so much file there and if i look at baby vi baby names dot csv here first name first name uh, county sex and count so this is the statistics collected about babies so in 2013 the name of the baby is gavin and saint lawrence is the county 
sex is male and uh, with the name Gavin, there are nine people who born in 2013. And in 2013, with the name Levi, next slide, nine people there. Logan, I think it's a nice name, 2013 Logan, 44 people born. Unfortunately, no Indian names, it will be zero, right? So, that is babynames.csv. I want to read this babynames.csv. And I want to read it from Spark. It is not in Hadoop. Can Spark work without Hadoop? Yes. Can you write a MapReduce program where your input is not Hadoop? No. Look at the difference. So, the first line of code that I am going to write is, come to this one where the code is there. Control L as you are already aware clears the screen, right? Val input equal to what it will do. What is the data type of input? Do you need to specify the data type of input? No, runtime inference, color man. Val input equal to sc dot. I am going to read the file. Text file is a function which will allow you to read the file. In bracket. If it is Hadoop, you will start with HDFS. And as you know, it is not Hadoop. So, I am going to write file. And it is there in slash users. I am giving the complete path. Don't get confused after file why you are putting three slashes. Two slashes are for your protocol and one slash is for your directory. And uh, in my system, it is in this folder. And the name of the file is babynames.csv. Double quote finish. And you are going to ask an immediate question. What is this SC came in? Who created that SC? Let me copy this line. And I am going to exit. How will you exit the color prompt? Control D. So, uh, I exited it just for showing you one thing more. I am going to start Spark Shell again. And please go through each and every line that is coming there. Right? To adjust logging level, use sc.setlog level. These are all information for you. You don't want a lot of clutter in your output, you will use it. Right? And please look, Spark context available as FC. So, don't get confused when any Spark programmer write two words in the code. SC or Spark. Which Spark? Lowercase Spark. Why? This is the modern Spark session. This is little old but giving you the Spark context. You cannot write any code in Spark without using SC or Spark. SC or Spark is the entry point. And now I am going to paste. Okay. And I finish off that. So I am creating a text file now. SC dot text file. Which is the baby names dot CSV. Alright, so what I am going to do is, I am going to now press enter and look for any errors. And look at that, even though you did not give any input, Spark has created a graph. Remember, Sam wants to put salt. Spark tells that, yes, I know that Sam has requested for a salt. RDD of string. It created resilient distributed data set. What is resilient distributed data set? That entire file is automatically divided not as blocks but as memory objects. And it is divided into different machines. Is it really divided? No. Plan. Lineage graph. 
has been internally created. How that is being created based on the block resistance? Hadoop configuration is internally used, so it is normally 128 MB. You can specify it if you want. So based on a lot of testing. 128 MB with Hadoop configuration it uses internally. No testing, Hadoop has already done that. So, this also you will use that 128 MB block size, but it will be in memory. Whether the file is written anywhere? No. Did you put an HDFS put command? No. Is your file in HDFS? No. Is there anything Spark did? No. So, what happened? You just told Spark that, hey, I want to do this. And when Spark will do something? Action. So, what is this? Transformations. So, se.txt file is a transformation. So, remember like this, assembly line started, I sparked it, it is lighting up, the burner is here and he told that I want to put salt. How? Read the file. That's what. Alright. Now, there are so many things to learn. If suppose I write input, it will tell you the data type. It is an RDD of string. Oh, RDD of string? From where it took string? I did not tell that, okay, read it as string. Internally, it uses Hadoop configuration. If it is using Hadoop configuration, anything that you are reading will be a string. You don't know that your line dot split, how it is taking line because it is there in the Hadoop configuration. Right. And now, print line in bracket input. You already know that particular method. It is telling the file is users let data baby names dot csv and it is a map partition rdd and it is a text file. I want to just take a peek of it. How will you take a peek in Unix? Tail minus f, all those kind of commands. Input dot take in bracket 10. What it is doing, you know? The old style, right? When the curry is being made, somebody will take it like this and tasting it. That's what we are doing. So, for tasting it, you need an action. Action means Spark will do something. What Spark will do? That plan will be executed. What is there in the plan? Read the file. Okay. Take 10. Huh? Oh, you got the data now? Take off 10. Did it read the entire file? No. Beauty there. It just satisfied you. Well, you are just tasting a little bit on your spoon, that's all. But not taking the entire curry. Java will take the entire curry and pour it on your mouth. <laughs> right? Clear, Shraji? Take is a kind of a sampling. Yes. Okay. Now don't ask what are the sampling other functions. We'll look at the documentation. And tomorrow you tell me what are the other. So input take of 10. That is the one. Okay. And but. What is this data? What I can do with this data? Year, first name, count, e sex count, 2013, Gavin, Lawrence, M9, 2013, everything. <coughs> I can't do anything useful with this particular data. Why? I will give you some vegetables and some will put salt. I will give you what you will do. Let Nag also do something. He came now. So, what we are going to do is, what we will do is, First, let us take out that header. How will you know the header? Control L. Clear the screen. Input dot first. And don't get too excited by typing input dot last. Huh? Because it is error. So, input dot first. It will give you this one. Oh, now I want something. Hey, hey. While the vegetables are being cut now, some ants came in. So, what we will normally do? Take it out, right? So, let us take it out and make it a little bit clean, right? How will you do that? What is the name of the RDD that you created? Input, input right? So, what I am going to do? Well, actual equal to, come on, input dot, come on, filter. And, uh, hey, you know, in the last class that uh, object upper and it was taking a string as a parameter and string of strings was the main and inside that we access it as a string. Like that, lot of 
data is there. I am going to take each line as a row and I am going to tell that the row is not equal to input.first. But before I am doing that, I have to store that input.first in a variable. I cannot write row is not equal to, oh sorry, I cannot write this, that, uh, well, actual equal to uh, uh, input dot filter in bracket row is not equal to what? Input dot first. Can you tell me why I cannot write it? Apply a little bit of common sense there. Assembly line is coming and the vegetables are there. He put the salt and Ag is going to get only the salted thing. From the salted thing, don't tell that give that vegetable without salt. Are you getting it? That is what you are telling here. So to avoid that, well, header equal to very good. And then oh, sorry. Following? So if suppose I want to write that, well, uh, header equal to input dot first, right? And always when you write, uh, make sure you are getting the data. And if you have any doubt, uh, doubt or anything, uh, do a print line. Okay, one, 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 one minute. When I write input dot first, what was your input string? This one, right? This one, right? Please look, this is a line, right? So input at first is that string, complete string should come now. How? Your, come on, your string is this. And I told input at first. But why, why first is only not to this two? Why first is not uh, up to M9? Why first is only that, that, that line? Oh, 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 where, where did you tell that? Spark users internally, Hadoop configuration. In Hadoop configuration, default line terminator is new line. And when that line is finishing, that is your entire string. Remember. So, if you want input dot first, sorry, uh, yeah, input dot first as only here, what you could have done, tell me. Ah, you will be writing a line to change your Hadoop configuration as delimiter, comma. Then you will see that it will read only here. Don't worry. Too much. So, if suppose you are going here, you got the first. And now I am going to write val actual equal to uh, uh, input dot what I am going to do? Filter. And I am going to filter all the rows where row is not equal to Input and row. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, where row uh, and input. This you have to learn. And this you cannot learn by looking at my screen and writing in the notes. Practice <coughs> command. Yeah, I have. I want to look at that. Right? So, what did you do? Okay, guess. A very simple question, okay? Don't worry about it. Why can't I write a map here? And this is what you should learn. And that, that learning will come only when by, when by by a lot of practice. Why can't I write a map there and map is taking row, 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 row. Look at the parameter. This is a condition. Row. Row not equal to header, true or false. Map cannot take true or false as a parameter. If you want to use map, then inside that you write a custom function, inside the function you return a boolean and then you use that particular function. That's possible. Okay, let's try. Uh, input equal to header, right? Oh, it now gave a map partition now. Previously it was a string. It filtered the data. And uh, okay, now actual dot first. Got it. So, 
it eliminated the header now now i got the data but can i do something on this particular data what will happen if i write actual of zero will i get 2013 come on will i get or not actual of zero will i get 2013 no why because actual of first is that entire string if you want gavin if you want 2013 if you want st lawrence what you need to do you need to split it by comma that's the next line so control l what's the variable uh, actual okay so well rows equal to oh, sorry rows equal to ha huh. uh, what is our actual, hey. actual dot Come on. Why it is filter? Are you going to filter the commas and then take all the extra and you want everything as a single name? What do you want to apply? Old, <laughs> uh, twenty years back technology you are telling me. What do you need to do? Come on. Will you apply map? So you have to apply a map. And inside the map, what you are going to write? Row. What is your row? What is your row? Internally, thing, na? Yeah, was that that assembly line is moving. What is your row? That complete line. Ah, what are you are going to write now? Right. Let's see. And now let us write. Rows of zero. Or rows dot first. You got individual elements now. See the difference. It was a string earlier, and now you are getting array of individual elements. Now tell me, I want to find out the name. And how many counts of each name? Only that I want to find out. Oh, find out. Okay. First, let me tell. Uh, let me ask you. I want all the names. Very names. That's my question. Okay. Come on. Well, B names. Ah. Huh. Ah. Huh. Yes. Ah. Huh. Yeah, sorry. Yes, row of row of one. What does that mean? Take that four line, enter line, and then take only that map. Right. So now, what will what will be there in B names? Right. And now, I want to print B names. How will you print the B names? Come on. B names dot collect for each. In bracket, print line. All this length. What it will do? Collect the, all the distributed objects from all the controls, and then you should get what? First program certification. Sure. Right. So the collect will bring everything to the right. Yeah, item. absolutely. Collect dot make string plus plus. All right. I got all the names. Oh, I want to write it as a JSON file. Some of you are very much eager for that. Right. So, commander, what is the name of the object that we have? B names, right? Okay. Well, df equal to b names dot to df. I converted it into a data frame, right? Oops. Yeah. And the data frame should still tell me that okay, it has got a string. The last line. It got a data frame. So, what is the name of the data frame? DF. What is the data frame? Don't worry. Okay. okay. Some are curious to know that. That's why I'm explaining. Probably uh, Satyuk has got a question. So data frame is nothing but an abstraction on the top of RDD. 
it is little bit advanced than RDD and you will learn it in the third class. I am just giving you an overview. So, data frame, I created a data frame and now what, what I want to do? Control L. The moment you go for a register timetable, normally what they will do is once you create a data frame, you will create a register timetable because then everything is available as a table and you can query it. The problem with the register timetable is that once you create a timetable and you apply any function, function on that timetable, it will use the default high format called the parkway. And you will feel that when the data is written, oh, it is compressed. It is actually parkway. If you say ORC, it will write ORC. You know, Avro, it will tell Avro. So, don't go through that register timetable. Huh? Way to catch the nose like this. What do you will write? df dot write dot mode append dot json end bracket. I am going to give the file. What is the file? File slash slash slash. Is it need to be hdfs? No. Users slash users slash and uh, what is the uh, directory? Data slash uh let me create a directory uh my result okay uh, today is uh, may 12 so may 12 is the directory that i am going to create okay it should be a directory not a file name so i am telling that okay write mode up and json okay now very interesting do you know how many partitions will be created look so when i write this let's let's see whether it is writing first or not you not specify the file name right file name not Directory, I am telling you now, oh, it is always the directory. Okay. File name, who will decide? Since Hadoop configuration is being reused, what will be your file name? Part dash. Okay. It will not be part something dash r dash 0000. zero, zero, zero. Alright. So you write that and then press enter, see whether something is happening or not. Oh, no error. And now let's go. What is the directory? Data. Inside the data, metal. Okay. So let us open a new screen and cd data ls is there a metal created there is cd metal and ls look at that extension right and now vi part dash right and then look at the data ah beautiful json is it encrypted no is it compressed no Never ever go for the save as text file from the register temp table because it will use parquet. And now if you are coming out, you will see that hey, I got two partitions I don't want. So let me just introduce you one more word. Okay. It will be very useful to you. I am going to give another directory. Okay. Uh, instead of May 12, I will give uh, May 10. Okay. Just, just for sample. And in the beginning, before you are writing the right mode. Okay. A beautiful function is there. Coalesce in bracket 1. What does that mean? Collapse all the output into one file is what coalesce, coalesce will do. So, coalesce of 1.write.mod and in bracket I am going to tell append. So, as and when a new file is coming, it will be appended. Write mod, you have CSV. You can use the write mod to write it to any file. And now I am going to create this particular output. Coalesce 1. Remember, earlier there were two partitions, right? And now let's run. Okay. And now let's come back to our screen. Right. Uh, Metan. Yeah. CD Metan. And then clear. Alas. Ah, only one file now. Because it's coalesced. And then look at the output. You got the entire data. So, that shows you the basics, the basics or the basic way of working with Spark. Clear? So, do a Spark shell, create a CSV, okay? Now, what's the exercise that I want for tomorrow? Can you think about a CSV file by yourself? 